This recording is about the 12 cases that will be on the quiz. Six of the cases have to do with reflection, as you see here, and the other six cases will have to do with refraction. In each case, we are going to begin with an object that is really far away and gradually move it closer and closer to the mirror. Here we will begin with an object really far away and gradually move it closer and closer to the lens. The conclusions that we are going to draw about the resulting image will be the same in reflection as they are in refraction. We begin with case one where the object is very, very far away. If you had a reflecting telescope, and this is the mirror of your reflecting telescope, you might be looking at something that is on a distant hill or a star or something like that. But at least in order for us to have an object of any size, it probably needs to be um, a few hundred meters away. So for all intents and purposes, when an object is that far away, the light coming off that object, going from left to right, and the object is way out there, for all intents and purposes, will be coming in parallel to each other because it's so far away. <clears throat> in other words, my object distance is so big compared to the other distances that I will be measuring that we can consider it an infinite distance away. <clears throat> Now, as these beams of light travel towards the mirror, in order to figure out where the beams of light are going to end up when they reflect off the mirror, we need to show a few vocabulary words. The P here stands for the principal axis. And that principal axis, of course, runs right to the very center of my mirror. The V stands for the vertex not to be confused with the word vortex. And, though that vocabulary word isn't all that important. F stands for the focal point, and C stands for the center of curvature. In other words, if I were to continue this circle all the way around, the C would be at the very center of the circle. Now, in order to establish where the image will be formed, if it does indeed form an image, we need a couple of rules about these incoming rays. Rule number one, is that rays that are coming in parallel to the principal axis, like all of these are, when they hit the mirror, will reflect through the focal point. Rays coming in parallel reflect through the focal point. Another rule we will see later is that rays that are coming in through the focal point will reflect out parallel but we don't have any of those rays in this case. A third rule could be that rays coming into the vertex at a certain angle will reflect off that vertex or from that vertex at the same angle, and we don't have any of those either. So the main point I need to make in case one is that my image is basically a point where all the rays intersect. It is considered a real image because it is made by real beams of light. This is going to be a very, very bright spot. If you had some sunlight coming off this mirror and you put like a piece of kindling or dried up leaves at this spot, you could ignite them on fire. So this would be a real image even though it is just a point in space. I should say just a point um, where the lines of light inter intersect. 
So it is neither upside down or right side up. It's just a point. Now, let's suppose we move our object to within a reasonable distance of my mirror. And again, we're going to follow the rules. But first of all, why do we use an arrow? Well, the nice thing about an arrow is it has a head, and we're going to put the tail right on the principal axis. So it's a very simple thing to draw. But this object could be a cow, a tree, a person, a basketball hoop, an aardvark, anything you want. Now, our rules are, rule number one, beams of light that are coming in parallel to the principal axis are going to go through the focal point. And beams of light coming into the focal point are going to come out parallel. And where they intersect is going to be the head of the image. Since these two beams of light are coming off the object, the head of the object, where they intersect will be the head of the image. And we can just assume that the rest of the object, the light coming off the rest of the object, will create the rest of the image. Technically, there's an infinite number of beams of light coming off this object. We could go to the trouble and talk about a beam of light coming in from the middle of my object and then being reflected through the focal point through the middle of the image and all the other beams of light as well. But all we need are just two, two beams or two rays. I will mention there's one other possibility that we could draw. I'll erase all of that. And that is that some people like to use this beam, and that is that a beam of light or a ray of light, let's get this correct, a ray of light that hits the vertex is going to bounce off the vertex, and this angle will equal that angle. The problem is we really don't have any way of measuring that angle. So it's best to use rays one and two and not ray number three. Now let's move the object in a little bit closer. Now my object is right on top of the center of curvature. And you'll notice that when we take our two rays, the parallel and the focal point one, and find where they intersect after reflection, you'll notice that my image is now upside down. It is exactly the same size as my object, and it is still, still real. This was a real image because it's made by real beams of light. This is a real image because it's made by real beams of light. If I had a piece of photographic film here, I would be taking a picture of my object, and it would be upside down and same size as the object. I could also um, put, um, besides a, a piece of film, I could also piece a screen uh, and, and see the image right there on a piece of white paper, for example. Now, the next thing we're going to do is move the object even closer. And this time, my object is between the center of curvature and the focal point. Now when we take our beam coming in parallel and our beam coming through the focal point and find where they intersect after reflection, you'll notice that I have created an image that is still upside down, but notice that my image is now bigger. It's magnified because it's larger than the object. And it's still a real image. Again, I could put a piece of paper here and look at the picture, look at the image, or I could put a piece of photographic film here and take a picture of it. Now, let's move it right smack dab at the focal point. When we put it right smack dab at the focal point, beams of light coming in parallel are going to go through the focal point. Kind of hard, though, to make a beam of light coming off the tip of the arrow and go through the focal point. There aren't any. We can use a different beam, though, a beam of light going through the center of curvature and the tip of the arrow will be reflected back on itself. 
So not only do you have rays of light coming in parallel, rays of light going through the focal point, rays of light going to the vertex and out, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, but now you have rays of light going through the center of curvature, and they will be reflected right back out on themselves because this right here, draw a tangent line, would be a right angle. And you'll notice that these two beams of light, when they emerge from the mirror, never intersect, which means we get no image. In other words, except for your ability to see the object directly, if we were to, if we couldn't see the object directly, we would see no object at all looking in the mirror. It would be, it will have disappeared. You can even simulate this by taking a spoon, holding it at arm's length, and looking at the concave part of the spoon. You'll appear to be upside down. As you bring it closer to yourself, at some point, your face will appear to be, will be right at the focal point of that spoon. It's not a perfectly curved spoon often. And your face will disappear, even though you're looking at it directly. Of course, your space has, your face has some dimensions, so your nose might disappear before the rest of your face. Now, lastly, we look at putting the object inside the focal length. Now, by the way, this is the focal length, the distance from the focal point to the mirror. This is the object length, the distance that the object is from the mirror. And if I back up a little bit, this is my image distance right here, the distance that the image is from the mirror. You're going to need those terms in this chapter. So when we get inside of the focal point, and you can see this if you're looking at a spoon and now it's close to your face, suddenly you appear to be right side up. You were upside down, then you disappeared, and now you're right side up. And the reason is that as you're looking at one of the beams of light that happens to go through the center of curvature across the top of your object, it's going to reflect back. But of course, your eye, let's say this is your eye over here, and here's your eyelashes. Your eye is going to project that beam of light past the mirror. It doesn't know that the beam of light is returning. It's going to project that beam of light past. And if we look at another beam of light, the beam of light that comes in parallel and then goes through the focal point, your beam of your eye is going to see that beam of light and project it also past the mirror creating an image on the other side of the mirror. You'll notice that the image is larger. You'll notice that it's right side up. But most of all, you should notice that it is now a virtual image. It's not real. The light doesn't go through the mirror. Just like when you're standing in front of a flat mirror and you're looking into there, you're just going to see yourself on the other side. Though you know you're not there, the light can't get back there because your mirror is mounted on a wall. It's in the way. So that makes that image that appears to be back there a virtual image. Now, we're going to repeat all six of these cases for refraction. If my object is way, way out here somewhere, beams of light coming in parallel, and when you're this far away, there are no beams of light coming in at any noticeable angle, and those beams of light will go through the focal point, and so your image is real, but it's basically a point, and it has no dimension to it. It's not upside down or right side up. And if you were to put some kindling or dried cotton or dried leaves or an ant, don't do that, and take your magnifying glass and direct the light on something that is at the focal point, the concentrated light can set it on fire. And indeed, that is sometimes what happens in forests or fields. Somebody is broken some glass or thrown a bottle out the window of a car and it shatters 
and a curved piece of that glass might focus the light from the sun onto the ground. And if there's anything here that's combustible, it can start a fire. Now we move the object a little bit closer. Again, here's my object distance right here. There's my object distance. Here's my focal length right there. But in lenses, I have the same focal length on the other side, assuming that these two curvatures are identical. They don't have to be, but for our purposes right now, the curvature on each side, the side facing the object, which is the one on the left, and the side that's opposite the object, the one on the right, we're assuming they have the same curvature, so their focal lengths are the same. So beams of light coming in parallel are going to go through the focal point. We could also have a beam of light coming through the focal point coming out parallel. And you can use the third option, a beam of light going through the vertex. There'll be a little bit of bending in here, which we're going to ignore. And then it also will help me predict where the tip of the arrow will be. And you'll notice that my image is inverted or upside down, same thing. And notice that it is smaller and notice that it is real because real beams of light are creating it. I could put a piece of paper or photographic film and see it. Now, in the unusual case that my object is just happens to be right at the center of curvature. The center of curvature is usually defined as two times the focal length. It all, again, it depends upon the kind of curvature you have in your lens, but for our purposes in general, the center of curvature is twice the focal length. So again, I can have beams of light coming in parallel, beams of light going through the focal point, beams of light going through the vertex. They'll intersect in the same place, and I get a real image upside down and exactly the same size. Now, the only kind of application that I can think of for something like this is called a Barlow lens. You'll notice all the times our images are upside down, like down here and up there. Well, if you add a Barlow lens to your telescope, it can take your upside down image and turn it right side up again for you without changing its size. That's called a Barlow lens. I got my first telescope way back in fifth or sixth grade and it had a Barlow lens, I remember. Now, case number four, we move our object between the center of curvature and the focal point. And now you'll notice that your image is bigger than the object. We've magnified it. It's real and it's upside down. And just like case five for reflection, case five in refraction, if my object is right smack dab at the focal point, then beams of light going through the vertex are gonna come out the other side and beams of light coming in parallel will go through the focal point. And you notice that this beam and this beam are parallel to each other. They never intersect, so you get no image. Even though the object is, is right there, you will get no image with your lens. It will have disappeared. And now finally, we put our object inside the focal length, between the focal length and the lens. And in this case, once more, we can we could talk about beams of light coming in parallel are going to be bent through the focal point. And we can talk about beams of light coming in through the uh, vertex are going to keep on going through the lens straight. And there are no beams of light that will go through the tip of the arrow and the focal point. And so in, this is like a magnifying glass here. In this case, let's say your eye is over here. There's your eyelashes, terrible looking eye. But as you're looking this direction, your eyes are seeing these beams of light and it projects those beams of light 
as if they were straight because your eye can't tell that this beam of light was bent. So it projects the, projects the beam of light and you get a virtual image and it is magnified. And of course, if you've ever looked at a magnifying glass at words on a page or something very, very small and close, it gets magnified, but it's a virtual image. You cannot capture it on a piece of film or see it on a piece of paper. It's going to be formed, um, ultimately the image will be formed on the retina of your eye. Those are the 12 cases. Those are the cases you need to be able to duplicate and understand um, for the quiz. And in every case, you need to know whether the object will be virtual or, the, excuse me, the image will be virtual or real, right side up or upside down or none, uh, magnified um, or smaller. Um, you need to be able to answer questions about that image. That's it.